Today I'd like to talk to you about your God-given rights. And now this sermon is going to be a very unique one in that it applies to everybody. Uh, whether you're saved or lost, whether you're born again or lost, uh, you don't know Jesus Christ, you don't uh, have anything to do with religion or you don't really believe the Bible or whatever else, I'm going to show you that God has set it up that you have three basic rights from Him. And it lines up with how He's created you. All right. Now, the founding fathers uh, here in America, they came up with a thing of um, your, your unalienable rights. Not unalienable rights, but unalienable. You can't put a lien against them. They're given to you by God. Nobody can take them from you. And they said, what are those? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, no, no, uh, not really. Uh, that doesn't really define what God has given you as your rights. I'm going to show you in this study, um, very basic, I could go really deep with this and every scripture, cover every scripture, but I'm just going to show you the basics of this. This is really something I'm probably going to end up writing down maybe in a booklet or something like that in the future because it's very important, especially nowadays with all the attacks on personal liberty. So let's start out in Genesis chapter 1. Let's go to the very beginning when God created man. Genesis chapter 1. Verse 26 and 27. And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. All right. When the Bible says there, our image, it's talking about the Godhead. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. It's one being, right? Body, soul, spirit. One being. That's what it's talking about. That's why it says our, meaning the Godhead there, image, singular. Trinitarians try to mess up that whole thing there and whatever else. They try to say there's three different persons speaking there. Well, then they would say our images, plural. No, it's our, all the members of the Godhead, in one person, one being. There's only one God in the Bible. They're not three gods, okay? Like the Trinitarians teach, and they profess that they don't, but they do. All right? And man is created in that image. So man has a body, a soul, and a spirit. I will show you the scriptures on that as we continue. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, there's the flesh, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, there's the spirit, and man became a living soul. Body, spirit, soul. Three parts to one man. And your God-given rights line up with those three parts, which we will be discussing as we go through this study. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Go to the New Testament now, to the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23. And I've been through these. If you're familiar with this ministry, I've been through this a lot. But just as if you're brand new to this whole thing and say, what, is my, what are my God-given rights? I'm going to show you according to the scriptures. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? There are three names given within the Godhead. Uh, the Trinity is, does not appear in scripture, so... Drop that term. It's not a Bible term. Within the Godhead, there is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Three, but there's only one God. Okay? Here you see spirit, soul, and body. Three, but there's only one person. You're not looking at three of me. You're looking at one man, and I'm composed of body, soul, and spirit. You look at my body. You can't see my spirit or my soul. That's just the way it is. But every one of those parts of man has a specific right given to it, attributed to it. And that's what we will be discussing today. But one final verse here just to kind of show you this thing of how we are made in God's image, whether you're saved or lost. Genesis, or excuse me, James chapter 3. Every man and woman that's ever been created, that's ever walked on this earth, had a body, a soul, and a spirit. There's never been a time when somebody was walking around with only a body and no soul and spirit or something. Um, we're all created in God's image. Whether you're redeemed or not, or saved or lost, doesn't matter. You're still created with that body, soul, and spirit. 
James chapter 3, verse 9, Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. We are similar to God. There aren't three persons of you walking around. There's one body consisting of body, soul, spirit. One person. Okay? Now, I'm going to tell you right at the very beginning how I believe the Bible breaks down the thing of your God-given rights. You have a body, a soul, and a spirit. How does it all work out? First and foremost, we're going to look at the spirit. What is the spirit? The spirit is the free will. You have the right to make your own decisions. Uh, if you think about it, you read the story of the Garden of Eden. God did not force Adam and Eve to think a certain way. He told them what to do, that they were not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but then he left it up to them. And that's been the theme down through the centuries. God does not force you into salvation, contrary to what some of the hyper-Calvinists out there believe. <laughs> They're heretics. Don't waste any time on them. God gives you free will. Man is given the right to choose one way or the other. That's something that you have there. That's one of your God-given rights. And if somebody tries to take your free will away, they're trying to go against your, your God-given rights. Don't let them do that. Secondly, we're going to look at the soul. What is that? Well, I believe it's personal defense. So, huh? Yeah. Because the soul is the part of you that's eternal. The soul is the part of you that feels certain things. They talk about your gut feeling. It's not up here. It's not actually that you're getting sick in your stomach when you walk into some place. It's that you get this weird kind of a feeling of uh, something just doesn't seem right or whatever. That gut feeling there, um, I believe, is related to the soul. That you just, you can't really explain it. You just have a weird kind of a feeling. And we'll see about the scriptures which line up with the soul and saying, defend my soul and protect my soul and things. We'll see about that. Uh, number three, your body. First we covered spirit, then we covered soul. Now what about the body? Your body is obvious bodily integrity. You have the right to take care of your body. And nobody can come and just, you know, some woman's walking down the street, some guy can't come and overpower her and say, I'm going to take your body and use it for my pleasure. That's called rape. You can't do that. Right? That's, I mean, people do it, but it's illegal. That's something that's a crime for good cause. You have integrity. And I shouldn't say you have integrity. You have um, bodily integrity, I should say it that way, um, in, the, in the sense that nobody can really tell you what to do with your body. And if they do, they're overstepping their rights and things and getting into taking away your God-given rights. So let's look here first at this spirit, which is your free will. Ephesians chapter 4 in the New Testament. And I'm, again, you know, well, I don't believe in the Bible. Well, okay, but I'm trying to define things according to the Scriptures. If you don't believe that this book here is God's Word, this King James Bible, well, that's, you're right. You have a free will. Okay? But what I'm saying as a Bible-believing Christian preacher, I can tell you that those three things, free will, personal defense, and bodily integrity, all are founded upon the Scriptures. Right? And uh, I think it was Horace Greeley said the one time, it is impossible to mentally or socially enslave a Bible-reading people. You say, well, what about organized religion? They don't read the Bibles. Okay? The people in the church buildings, there's no scripture for church buildings. There's no scripture for 10% tithe or wearing your Sunday best. Don't run in church. Uh, win, go out and win souls uh, by knocking on doors. and think. There's no scripture for any of that stuff. Not for one bit of it. It's all marketing, it's all sales, it's all cult-like control, which I've been preaching against that stuff for years and years, and I came out of it, all right? Um, those people are enslaved because they don't read their Bible. They don't want to follow the Scriptures. Please make the, the difference there. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22 through 24. That ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, talking about when you get saved, you put away that old life that you had, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Your mind changes, your life changes when you get truly born again. That's the whole point of being born again. I'm a new man now. 
the man that I once was, is dead and gone. I buried him. He doesn't come back. I'm a new man. I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. My mind changed. Hmm. You see? The spirit of your mind. The spirit is, is, is related to the mind up here. The Holy Spirit of God, through His Holy Word here, can put things into my mind. And I can read this and I can understand this and say, hey, wait a second here. They're telling me that I have to do this or that or whatever. Some, somebody says, hey, come do this or something. But my Bible says differently. Which one do you think I'm going to follow? Yeah. Let me make up my own mind. You see? Philippians chapter 1. Verse 27. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, look at this, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Again, you see spirit and mind connected. The Holy Spirit, he doesn't just come and say, oh, I have a good feeling. <laughs> you know, No, he reveals truth. When the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth, the Bible talks about. The Holy Spirit comes and he says, hey, look at this. Hey, look at that. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John chapter 14, verse 6. He leads us into truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. John 17, 17. This book right here can lead you into the truth. Oh, we're coming out with a central bank digital currency here and and." It's brand new and old. Oh, this will be the latest thing and whatever, and we have to get rid of cash and whatever else. Oh, uh, yeah, it's called uh, the foundation for the mark of the beast. Well, how do you know that? Because I have a Bible that told me so. <laughs> oh, this is such a new, oh, what a new concept. A cashless system? Huh. Wow, that's such a new, it's not new. <laughs> Bible-believing preachers have been warning about this thing for years. You know, back in the old days, early 1900s, they, preachers back then were warning about social security numbers. And then in the 1960s, they started warning about the barcodes on the back of products and food and things like that. Then they started war warning about the, you know, the little thing on the, at the cash register there where they scan the barcode and beep, beep. We've been warning about the thing, a cashless, cashless uh, system for, you know, 100 years probably. It's not new to us. We understand it. Why? Because we're renewed in the spirit of our mind. Let me show you another verse. Romans chapter 12. Nobody's going to get into my mind and tell me what to do in my mind. Uh, that's crossing the line. God gave me the right. God gave you the right to uh, make up your own mind on things. And not to be forced or coerced or have your mind controlled by external forces and whatever else. That's wrong. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Well, this is written to a Christian. Obviously, you can't really prove what is the perfect will of God for your life if you're lost and on your way to hell, if you haven't trusted that Jesus died on the cross and was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And He did it for you. He did it for your sins. He paid for your sins. I did say you have to come to church and give me 10% of your tithe money or your income you know, before taxes or something. No, that's <laughs> unscriptural. What I'm saying is you need to have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ according to the Scriptures. So that's an important thing to do if you haven't gotten saved. But uh, please understand what I'm saying here in this study. You say, well, I don't think I want to make up my own mind or my mind on this. Well, good. Good. I'm not trying to control your mind. I'm trying to present what the Scriptures say and then say, you make up your own mind. But you see, as a Christian, I have to constantly renew my mind, refresh it. Refresh the page up here in my head. Why? They're saying I need to do this, and society's saying I need to change this way and do this thing here and whatever. 
I've, you know what? I can't think of the verse. There's a verse of scripture. Oh, I can't. It's just trying. I'm trying to remember what how it goes. I better look it up. Um, you know, uh, I was at the store today, and and uh, this guy came up to me, and we got to talking and everything else, and I just, uh, I totally locked up. I could not think of the verse of scripture. I said, "There's," I said, there, "What you just said, it lines up with the Bible," and and I'll I'll next time I see, I'll have that verse for you. I promise. And I came home and I got my concordance out. I went and I got my sword searcher software on my computer and, and I looked up the verse and the verse is renewing my mind all the time. Why? Because nobody else has a right to tell me or nobody has a right to tell me what to do with my mind. Okay? You say, even God? Even God. He gives me free will. I can take this book and I can close this book and I can put that book over on the shelf right there, over on this table right here beside me, and just say, eh, you know, I'm going to go watch uh, hunting shows and motocross and whatever else, other kind of anything I want, documentaries, and I can do whatever I feel like doing. God is not going to force me to take time and read his book. I have to do it myself by an act of my own free will. I can resist the Holy Spirit. I can grieve the Holy Spirit as a saved, Bible-believing preacher. Why? Because God gives free will. And when you have people coming along and they're saying, oh, well, we need to take away that free will. Um, there's no time for you to make up your own mind. You are forced to come in here and you're forced to do this and you're forced to do that. You say, well, it goes against my conscience. It goes against what I believe what God's Word says, then you don't follow them. I'll follow God and His Word. He gave me certain rights, and the first one of those is free will. Um, a lot of the old-time Protestant guys and whatever else, and some of them were really good men, uh, they fought for liberty of conscience. Roger Williams and Oliver Cromwell um, both were big proponents of liberty of conscience. Um, you have liberty to make up your own mind. On things it's an important thing next let's talk about personal defense with your soul first Kings chapter 1 verse 29 first Kings chapter 1 and verse 29 Okay, it says here, And the king sware and said, As the Lord liveth, that hath redeemed my soul out of all distress. Now in the Old Testament, without going into a huge big theological study here, in the Old Testament their soul and their flesh was connected. That's why if they touched unclean things, their soul would be affected. And they would have to go and do special sacrifices with the Levitical priesthood and everything else. In the New Testament there's a circumcision made without hands where body and soul are now separated. So if I touch something that's unclean or I do something stupid that's unclean, it doesn't affect my soul because I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise until the day of redemption. I'm born again. My sins are washed away. So there's a difference there. Okay, so I do want to say that. But in the sense of soul being there in the body and dictating some th certain things and saying, I'm in some distress here. I can feel this, I, you know, and you'll feel that. You could be walking down some back alley at night and you just feel a sort of a fear, kind of a, uh, and you're not seeing anything. There's no clicks of a gun that somebody's going to shoot you, no laser sight, you know, going here on your chest or something or whatever. You just feel there's something really wrong here. I remember fishing years ago out in Montana and uh, I was in these really rocky area by this one river and, um, and I heard something above me. And it was something big, and it was stalking me. And I'd walk a little bit, and it would walk a little bit. And my brother and my father were way downstream. And I thought, oh boy, I think it was a mountain lion, a big one up above me. And I could feel it. I didn't feel it in the sense of, oh, I'm reaching up, and oh, yeah, there's the hairy foot, yeah, there's the leg, and oh, there's his teeth, you know. I didn't feel it that way. I couldn't feel it with my body. I didn't intellectually see it. 
up there. Oh yeah, there it is. You know, no, I could just feel, I had that bad gut feeling of, oh, something's wrong. That distress there. I felt that I've gone into stores and no, nothing openly badly wrong. Some guy, you know, holding a gun or a knife behind me or something. I just feel a, uh, there's something there. It's your soul warning you. And I know plenty of lost people and they talk about that. It's ah, a really bad gut feeling. I just, and it works both ways too. Sometimes you have a really good feeling and you say, I think this is going to work out. And it does. That's your soul. Psalm 7. Turn to Psalm 7. I'll show you another passage here. That talks about the soul. Once we understand our God-given rights, then we understand that uh, God is a higher authority. Our Creator is a higher authority than anybody in the government. So if anybody in the government comes along and they say, hey, we're going to take away those God-given rights, you say, no, sorry. Um, and, you know, again, even if you're an atheist, I don't believe in God. I don't believe in the Bible. Okay, do you believe that you have free will up here? Do you believe that you have sort of that gut feeling, I can sense something? And do you believe that you have bodily integrity? Nobody should be able to come and do anything to your body, come and touch you if you haven't given them permission. There's really no debate here. Uh, I'm just, what I'm trying to do is just give you the scriptures that support what I'm trying to say. Psalm 7, verses 1 through 6. O Lord my God, in thee do I put my trust. Save me from all them that persecute me and deliver me, lest he tear my soul like a lion, rending it in pieces while there is none to deliver. Uh, you can't tear a soul to pieces. What's he talking about? Well, in the Old Testament, again, remember, soul and body are connected right there. But it, again, it's talking about your soul. If you're in great distress, it's, it's like your soul's torn and you, think, you really feel hurt deeply and whatever. If you go through a really bad breakup in a relationship, you just feel it really deep within you. It's, it's not that you got hit physically or anything. You just, oh, you really are heartbroken. That's the soul. Verse 3, O Lord my God, if I have done this, if there be in iniquity in my hands, if I have rewarded evil unto him that was at peace with me, yea, I have delivered him that without cause is mine enemy, let the enemy persecute my soul and take it. Yea, let him tread down my life upon the earth and lay mine honor in the dust. Selah. Arise, O Lord, in thine anger, lift up thyself because of the rage of mine enemies, and awake for me to the judgment that thou hast commanded. Now, it's a very interesting thing here. Verse 3, O Lord my God, if I have done this, if there be iniquity in my hands, if I'm the one in the wrong, verse 4, if I rewarded evil unto him that was at peace with me, yea, I have delivered him without that without cause is mine enemy, let the enemy persecute my soul. So what he's saying here is, if I have done some kind of a crime, if I have committed some kind of an offense, then let my enemies take me out. Let them beat me up or tear me down or whatever else. I deserve it. In other words, if I've done something to offend somebody or wrong somebody, then they have a right to attack me. But if they haven't, if I haven't done anything wrong, then they have no right to go after me and persecute my soul and hurt me deeply. They have no right to do that. Where's he getting that from? Old Testament Judaism or something? No. This is something that's true for anybody, whether saved, lost, belief, you know, Catholic, Jew, Muslim, Hindu, atheist, Freemason, Jesuit, Illuminati, Bilderberger, doesn't matter what you are, gun-owning conservative, uh, you know, vegan liberal or something like that, doesn't matter. It's true for everybody. Why? Because it's a God-given right. And nobody can take it from you. Psalm 55. Nobody can take it from you, but you can give it up. You can let other people take advantage of you. Psalm 55, verse 16 and 18. As for me, I will call upon God, and the Lord shall save me. Uh, Evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. He hath delivered my soul in peace from the battle that was against me, for there were many with me. 
God can deliver your soul. And many times you get into a really bad situation and all of a sudden you come out of it and you think, wow, I sure was lucky. Uh, probably not lucky. Um, I can tell you it was actually God that spared you. He had some reason for you to live longer. Give you another chance to accept the gospel or whatever else. Um, I can't count how many times that that's happened. The Lord delivered my soul. Um, I've never been in an actual military type battle, but uh, I've had some pretty bad stuff happen over the years. Luke chapter 22. We'll go to the New Testament now. Luke 22. Say, so, well, I believe more in luck than I believe in God. Well, okay. You want to believe in an, in an impersonal game of chance like luck? Well, that's up to you. I'd rather believe in there being a creator out there who watches over me and protects me. Luke chapter 22, verse 35 and 36. And he said unto them, When I sent you without purse and scrip and shoes, lacked ye anything? And they said nothing. Then said he unto them, But now he that hath a purse, let him take it, and likewise his scrip. And he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. Huh. Um, Jesus. Meek, mild, passive Jesus. No, he wasn't. Um, hey, if you, uh, if you need a sword, if you have, don't have a sword, then uh, why don't you sell your, your coat there, your garment? Sell that and go make sure you have a good sword. Just in case you have to defend your soul. Just in case you get into a bad situation where you feel kind of a, uh, something doesn't seem right to me here. I don't know what it is. Something just, uh, I, don't, I don't know. I have a bad feeling. Okay. Uh, you say, well, so we should be defending ourselves with, with uh, swords? Well, maybe that's all you have, but... Uh, there's other options. <laughs> you know what I mean? Personal defense. Um, hey, here comes some bad guys. Oh, they have some clubs and some whatever else, hammers and things. They're just going to come in and just beat us to death and everything. Well, okay. I don't want to uh, upset them by being mean to them. And so I'll just kind of let them come in here and, and I I really, oh, they're, they're beating my son right now. He's out there in the yard and oh, he's screaming and boy, that, that kind of hurts my soul. But, you know, I don't want to hurt their soul. No, I have a right to my own personal defense of myself, but I'm also entrusted with a wife and a son. And if anybody messes with them, they're going to have to deal with me. Why? Because... They don't have a right to go take away the life of my son and my wife. I'm going to defend them. And you should defend yourself. Nobody has a right to just come up to you and start uh, attacking you and whatever else. And finally, let's look at bodily integrity. Your body. The flesh that you have. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. First Corinthians chapter three. Again, this is written to a Christian, but there's a sense in which it can apply to anybody. All right. First Corinthians chapter three, verse sixteen and seventeen. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? For saved people, if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy. Which temple ye are? Not a church building someplace. Okay, God has no temples right now on this earth that he's for or anything else. Um, sorry to the Catholics and the Jews and the Muslims and all the other people with their satanic buildings. Okay, uh, God's not in them. Howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Acts chapter 7 talks about. And they killed Stephen for saying that. The religious leaders of his day. Pretty much the way you get killed if you try to speak against the church buildings and the temples and the synagogues out there today. And the basilicas and all the other stuff. Um, what's my point? Um, regardless if you're saved or lost, if you know Jesus Christ or if you don't, you still have a right to take care of your body. Why? Because if you don't take care of your body, you will suffer. You will have problems. If you drink too much, you'll get drunk. 
eventually have cirrhosis of the liver or some other kind of a thing or, you know, wrap around a telephone pole, you know, disease or something, driving while intoxicated. Um, you smoke too much. Eventually you get emphysema or cancer. You do too many drugs. All the problems with that, you know, has it goes along with it and everything else. You're just very promiscuous with your sexual life and whatever else. Uh, you get all kinds of venereal diseases. Anything that the Bible condemns as sin, if you do it too much, you're going to ruin the body that you're living in. And pretty soon, you know, uh, oh boy, I've really gone out and I've, you know, I've seen, I, I've known loggers over the years and things and they, oh, I'm too tough to use hearing protection or eye protection, whatever else. And then, oh, I had to have an eye surgery because something got in my eye and, and you go up to me and you say, hey, so how are you doing today? I, I'm sorry, I can't hear too good. What, how would you say? Uh, what'd you do? You're too tough to use hearing protection, but now you can't hear. Um, didn't take care of your temple there, did you? Didn't take care of your body. So they're right. They can do it if they want, but it's a foolish thing to do. You go out and you live after the flesh. The Bible says, ye shall die. Some guy comes up to some woman and says, hey, come on, we're going over here into this uh, little patch of trees over here. I'm going to rape you. She has to say, no, you're not going to do that. Oh, come on, baby, yes, we're going to do it. Uh, I said no. <laughs> or whatever other things she has, or, or, you know, take out your keys and, you know, here's my keys that I carry. I have a little Leatherman tool there. It makes a nice handle, and you just take that thing and just flip it over the guy's face or smack him down over this way, across the face this way. If he's trying to rape you, hit him hard. Why? He's trying to go after your body, trying to take away your bodily integrity. Somebody comes along and they say, oh, you have to have a hokey pokey to turn yourself around here at work. Uh, no, I'm not going to do that. Uh, no, thank you. Oh, but uh, there's a disease that's a 99% uh, recovery rate. It's very deadly. You can have it and not know that you had it. You, you really need to be careful here. We have to give you the hokey pokey. Uh, no, <laughs> not happening. Why? Because you're trying to mess up my temple. You're trying to mess up my body. That's unacceptable. As a Christian, the Spirit of God lives within this temple. As a lost person, you still have right to your body. You know what? I can't come and say, okay, this King James Bible, you're going to accept the Lord. I'm going to grab you by your throat. I'm going to say, accept him or else I'll kill you. I can't do that. I can't forcibly convert, you know, have a, my sword here and a, or an axe or something like this. There's an axe, you know, and I'm, you know, convert or die. That's not Bible-believing Christianity. You don't want to accept Jesus Christ? Okay, bye. See ya. That's what the New Testament teaches. I can't forcibly convert someone. You know why? Because I'd be taking away their God-given rights. See, but they're, but they're going to go to hell if they're not a Christian. Yeah, that's their right. I can't take that from somebody. And any church that tries to do that, any religion that tries to forcibly convert people, is not a religion that God founded. Crusades. Jihad. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Don't blame me for what people have done to twist this book to their own political agendas. The Lord did not found organized religion. Organized religion uh, murdered Jesus Christ. They were the ones that nailed him to the cross. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 4. The wife hath not power of her own body but the husband, and likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body but the wife. There's the one exception to the thing of Nobody can tell me what to do with my body. The Bible talks about the thing there. It's talking about the marriage bed, intimacy within marriage. Okay, that's a time when you say, hey, I might not be in the mood right now, but my husband or my wife is, and so, okay. It's not a bad thing. All right, that's, what's, that's the one exception to the rule of somebody having power over your own body. But again, you're doing that thing out of charity, out of love for your partner and saying, okay, hey, we can do that. All right, I wanted to put that in there just to, to show you that there is one exception to it. 
But let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. But uh, it's only your husband or your wife if you're married, by the way. It's not your doctor or the politicians or somebody in the media or whatever else, volunteer, army, reserve coming to your front door or something like that. No, no, no. Um, the only one that has power over my body uh, is ultimately me and my wife. And that's it. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly. So fight I, not as one that beateth the air. But I keep under my body, and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Um, keeping yourself in good shape. Now this is speaking, in a physical sense, he's referring to runners, like the ancient Olympic type runners and things that you would have there in ancient Rome. But uh, he's comparing it, he's showing something physical, but he's comparing it to the spiritual. And he's saying, if you don't take care of your body, you're not going to be running a very good race for Jesus Christ. You have to make sure to keep under your body and bring it into subjection and say, hey, don't eat too much. Don't sleep too much. Don't eat too little. Don't sleep too little. Don't drink too much alcohol. Don't whatever. You see, don't eat a whole bunch of junk food. It's not good for you. That's what he's talking about there. But again, who makes that decision? Well, you should consult your doctor before entering any kind of a food program or whatever else. No, you shouldn't. No, you shouldn't. I'm not going to consult my doctor if I want something to eat or whatever else. I, I learned that stuff myself. Um, I can go out and I could get drunk tonight if I felt like it. I have that right. I can defile my temple if I feel like it. But I don't want to do that. Why? Well, because I realize I'm running a race. Some guy says, hey, I'm going to have a one can of beer or something. Or somebody says, I'm going to have a, a glass of wine or something like that. I mean, growing up, it was just, oh, my, no. You'd, alcohol, for any reason, is just ultimate sin. Well, that's not what the Bible teaches. You're lying if you, do, if you say that. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible says, do all things in moderation. I mean, there are people that, yeah, they can't handle alcohol. Well, then stay away from all of it. That's a good idea there. But if somebody says, hey, our culture, my, you know, traditions, my family, my country, whatever else, we drink very responsibly. Fine. Go ahead. Do it. It's your body. I can't take away what you do with your body. And all the cults out there, they try to do that exact thing. The way that you can tell that you are in real, true Bible-believing Christianity is if you look and you see those three things. The free will, personal defense, and bodily integrity. Are they there in that group of Christians? Hey, you're not allowed to eat fish. It's Friday night. Or you're not allowed to eat certain types of meats. It's Friday night or something like that. Oh, oh, oh sorry. No. Um, hey, you have to take the hokey pokey. Turn yourself around. That's what it's all about. Uh, no. No, I'm not doing that. Hey, you have to cut yourself in certain ways here. No, I'm not going to do that. I walked into your uh, weird satanic building and I instantly got a feeling of, uh, my soul doesn't appreciate being in here. Sorry, leaving. <laughs> hey, uh, you need to come in here. You need to submit yourself to the man of God. I'm going to tell you what to do with your life. I'm the preacher. Uh, you mean you're trying to take away my freedom, my free will, my ability to think for myself. So you meet a real Bible-believing preacher like myself, I'll present the gospel to you and then say, here you go. You figure out what to do with it. You say, well, how do I pray? How do I ask the Lord to save me? Well, I can lead you in a little bit of a model prayer, but ultimately it's got to be between you and the Lord. I can't convert you. The Bible talks about Paul planting in Apollos watering, I think is how it is, but God gives the increase. God's the one that makes it grow. I can put a seed in the ground and my wife can come along and she can put water on it. But until God says, okay, time to grow, doesn't mean anything. 
So I just wanted to put that study together quickly. Um, been thinking a lot about that because we, you know, we're getting into this really weird thing in the world where, you know, everything's just up for debate now and whatever else. And how, well, you know, what are what pronoun do you identify yourself as? Well, you know, I'm I identify now as a, a Spanish nun named Carmelita or something. Oh, okay. Well, I respect that. You know, um, I don't prefer to be called he anymore. I prefer to be called it or um, the, the preacher who was once named Fir Tree or something. You know, and, and you get into this weird world where things are going and you think, okay, how do I deal with these people? Well, very simple. You say, I have God-given rights. Well, where's your proof? Well, I can show it to you in the Bible. I have the scriptures here. Go back through the study and, and write down those scriptures so that you can turn to it in King James Bible and say, God gave me those rights. I might not be a Christian. I might not be this. I might not whatever. But you know what? It makes sense to me. That Bible says, lines up with those things. The spirit of your mind. I have free will. God redeemed my soul out of all distress. I have personal defense. The right to defend myself. The right to feel, hey, this is wrong or that's wrong. I, I don't like this. This is bad. And thirdly, I have bodily integrity. No man is supposed to defile my temple. Nobody can come along and tell me what to do with my body. Those are my rights. And if what you're saying contradicts my God-given rights, then I will rely on my Creator. Nobody's taking my God-given rights from me. You can't legislate them away. Oh, well, we got uh, this new liberals out there in Congress and whatever else, and they just passed a law. Does it contradict my God-given rights? Well, yes, but then I'm not following it. <laughs> I don't care. Pass all the ridiculous, stupid nonsense you want. You know, there's all the debate about the Second Amendment, right? Oh, well, I, what was the original intent of the Second Amendment? I mean, maybe, see, back then when the Founding Fathers wrote it, and well, let's debate it. Let's get our, bet, our best constitutional scholars together and we'll debate if you have the right to actually have an, a firearm or not or whatever else and things. And Well, we can prove that there are studies. Recent studies have shown that firearms aren't needed. Uh, well, I have recent studies that show that firearms are needed. And, uh, no, actually, I have a God-given right to personal defense. And then nobody's going to take that from me. Bodily integrity. So you want to come and, and make my body holy? I'll make your body holy. You know? I have free will. I can make up my own decision. We have to define our rights. Um, I don't have a right to uh, electricity. Okay? That's a privilege. I don't have a right to gasoline or diesel or or uh, groceries on the store shelves or whatever. All that stuff can be taken away. I can't do anything about it. But you can't take away my God-given rights. Period. So that is going to be it. I hope it's been a challenge to you out there, whoever you are watching this. Like I said, if you really want the scriptures for it, go back through, write them down. Um, get a King James Bible. You can get them at a dollar store. You know, they're not that expensive. I mean, this is a Cambridge one I've had for so many years now. Um, probably, I would say at least 20 years I've had this Cambridge Bible. Um, but there's, you know, I have videos on the best King James Bibles out there, local church Bible publishers, church Bible publishers. Um, there's a bunch of them. Uh, you know, get a good King James Bible or just go pick up one of the dollar store or something. Go down to a used bookstore. They have them there. Make sure it's a King James version. Uh, the new ones I can't recommend those. They come from the Vatican, from organized religion, you know. Um, this King James Bible is the only one that doesn't have a copyright. Now you can get a Cambridge, you know, edition and they have a crown copyright for their study notes and their other things in it, but they aren't copywriting the text of the King James Bible. So that's why it's so freely printed. It's the most printed, most published book in history right here. And this is what America was founded upon, by the way. I'd like to add that. People that said, you're not going to enslave me mentally or socially, physically, 
spiritually, anything, I will not be enslaved because I have a book. A book that defines my God-given rights. So that is going to be it. Thank you very much for watching, and um, we'll see you in the next video. King James Video Ministries has been faithfully preaching and teaching from God's Word since 2008. Our YouTube channel has never been monetized, and we do not accept money from the lost world because this would violate the Scriptures. King James Video Ministries is supported by saved brethren in accordance with 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17 through 18. If you have been blessed by our videos, we would ask that you prayerfully consider supporting this ministry financially. You can donate online by visiting www.kingjamesvideoministries.com or by sending a check or money order to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 214, Patton, Maine, 04765. Thank you to all who donate to this ministry, and we pray for the Lord's blessing in your lives.